going to have screening and the panel will be showing Sleep Dealer. Uh, we said that it's a dystopian film about not so far-fetched future. And we're going to hear a brief intro to film and technology by our film professor Rick Hilden. And uh, once we're done and with uh, screening and when you guys come up with all these questions that came out as a consequence of seeing really very, very challenging uh, events, possibilities, and uh, hints shown in this film. Uh, Scarlett Trelli, our engineering professor, and Andrea Ergot, our geography professor, are going to wrap up, give us a little bit of their thesis, and uh, help us discuss the topics further. So, welcome, and we are ready to start now. Carrie, can you close the doors, please? Yes. Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, as you um, just heard, my name's Richard Filden. I'm from the Film Studies faculty here. What I want to talk to you about just for 10 minutes before the film starts is just the idea of film and technology, and in particular science fiction films, how they relate to what we're interested in for this year on. Okay? So, having said we're going to talk about film and technology, we we'll start by saying that films are magic. Completely throw technology out the window. Imagine you were living 120, 125 years ago before the invention of film. Okay? You can't record anything. We have no record of life. But a man comes along and he has a bet and the bet is that when a horse runs, its feet all leave the ground. And no one can prove this or disprove it. You can't run along the side of a horse and watch its feet and see if they'll leave the ground. It moves too fast. So, somebody comes along, takes what is the early photo uh, photographic equipment that exists, adapts it, and turns it into a, a device to take pictures of a horse as it runs. And they discover the horse's feet leave the ground. Someone else comes along, brings a new piece of technology. And that piece of technology is a plastic film that you can run through a camera and you can put chemicals on and you can use it to record photos on a flexible surface instead of glass plates or metal plates, which was used before. A little bit more technology. And somebody else comes along and they build a little box and they fill it with cogs and gears and they run this new film through it and they have a shutter that opens and closes and as the shutter opens and closes, light comes in, they take pictures. Then they build another box that does a reverse to fire the light through that, and pictures appear on a wall. For the first time in history, we can record light. We can see it move when it doesn't catch fire, because the early cameras burst into flames randomly in a rather embarrassing fashion. But for the people who were seeing this, this is magic. This is the world captured for the first time. And they see images like this. These are the first images that turn up on screens. If you thought the Reddit was the home of cat videos, you were very much mistaken. Dr. Edison was making cat movies long before YouTube turned up. <laughs> but this, I said it's magic. And the reason I say it's magic and it's technology is this is time travel. This isn't film, this is time travel. This is the ability to bring the dead back to life, to see them walk. 20 years after these films, turn up to hear them talk. Imagine for the thousands of years that humanity has existed, this is the first time in these last 120 years that we could bring the past back in front of us. And it really is kind of magic. It really is kind of special. That's why I study film. That's why I'm interested in it. It's an amazing idea that we've only had for a brief, tiny moment of human history. Nowadays, if we don't record something, we question if it's happened. We're so used to recording things. If, if we don't have a camera pointed at it, if you go to a concert and you're not holding your iPad over your head, recording images and disturbing the person behind you, there's something missing from it. Recording has become completely part of our lives, and yet it's only existed for this tiny, tiny period of time. Yet it's now so important to us. We have a camera at the back recording this. Everything gets recorded. Um, is there supposed to be a... No, 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 that's fine. That's absolutely fine. 
Technology and cinema are completely and utterly intertwined. Technology has given us 3D film long before James Cameron was doing it. Back in the 1920s, 3D films existed in cinemas. Um, it's given us the ability to have a film without catching fire. It came a little bit later. It's given us CGI, which allows you to have science fiction films, and it's allowed you to get those movies sent straight to your phone, no matter where you are. It's all technology, all driving cinema. So cinema is technology, but it's also all about humanity. It's all deeply, deeply connected to humanity. Films bring us together. In some countries, they're still absolutely the dominant form of education, of education, entertainment. They bring communities together like nothing else, because we see them all together in a dark room as a group, rather than at home in a TV, watching your TV separated from everybody else. They bring us all together. When people first came to this country, silent films connected immigrants who couldn't speak English with immigrants who could speak English. They had a shared form of communication, a shared form of entertainment. In Russia, when the revolution happened in 1917, silent films educated people about the theories of communism and the ideas because the people they were trying to educate were illiterate and could not read or write. So silent film was the way to communicate them. Film is incredibly powerful. In England, it connects the diaspora, it connects the people of India who live in England to um, their culture and their community. Indian films are so popular that Hindi films are very often in the top ten in England, up with the English language films. So they connect people across the world. It's all about humanity. Films dominate our culture and we worship their stars. Very, very powerful stuff. But we're here to look at a specific type of film, and that type of film is... Uh, science fiction. And now the slide should move forward, but it is ignoring me. Hey, science fiction. Fantastic. So what is science fiction? It's a genre of film, just like horror films or fantasy films. It's got some specific stuff about it, though. There's some very specific things. What science fiction does is it takes the world we live in, it takes the science we have, and moves it forward just a little bit, or a very long way. It expands worlds. Horror films, when they deal with science and people moving it forward, see people having to be punished for doing that. Frankenstein creates the monster and must be punished. Fantasy films break the rules. People make wishes, and whatever rules we have in the world is going out the window. It doesn't matter anymore. It makes those worlds visible to us. CGI allows us to see these worlds. Film brings worlds to life for us. Science fiction in particular expands our world through technology and lets us see it. It creates wonder in an audience, and that's fantastic. But the really important thing... Oh, we're going backwards now. I love PowerPoint. The really important thing about science fiction is it makes you think. Unlike almost every other Hollywood genre, which is designed for you to be immersed emotionally and not think at all, Hollywood never wants you to think, Science fiction wants you to think. It raises questions. It brings things forward for us to consider. And it's powerful stuff. And it's been doing it since the very, very beginning of science fiction. So, you're going to skip slides. Give me two seconds. There we go. Let's go back. The very first, and this is why we don't use PowerPoint. There we go. Thanks a lot. Anyway, Metropolis, the very first science fiction film, 1927. It's a film about a world that's divided in two. We have the rich and we have the workers. And the workers live underground and they power machines to allow the rich to live a life of luxury. A scientist creates a robot and he copies the leader of the um, workers and turn, creates a robot in her image so that they can infiltrate and they can bring about um, the destruction of the revolution they think is about to happen. Um, and the film goes on and Maria is say, turned into the robot, early science fiction, early special effects. Um, and eventually the son of the person who rules the upper levels comes as this kind of messenger between the two, brings the two sides together and allows the workers to join with the industrialists who run the place and bring about peace. So right at the beginning of film, the science fiction film, we've got those questions coming up already. We've got class and social order. We have the idea of technology subjugating humans, technology being used by humans to subjugate other humans. 
We have the rich and the poor. We have class gaps. With the banking crisis that we've just gone through, and the idea of those very, very rich to 1% and the rest, the ideas from Metropolis, Dr. Frankenstein on the screen included, are all just as relevant today as they were when the film came out. Powerful stuff, science fiction. Next one I want to talk about very briefly is Blade Runner. Some of you may have seen this one. Um, Blade Runner asks questions as well. Blade Runner, which is just called, Back to life, Blade Runner. Blade Runner is uh, another futuristic world where robots have been created to take away the chores, take away the work that people don't want to do. All the haves have left the world and they've taken the robots into space with them and they set them to work doing dangerous work, they have them as prostitutes, doing all the stuff that humans don't want to get involved in. But when they come back to Earth, because they've been given emotions and they start to feel and they want to live longer because they're only allowed to live for three years, we have the clash again. Blade Runner has flipped the idea on its head. Now it is, what's our responsibility to the things that we create rather than how they affect us? If we create life, do we have the right to extinguish it? So it plays with the moral questions here. Flips things around. Ask the audience to consider questions that they may not have considered before they walked into the theatre. And many other science fiction films do very similar things. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Technology is the driver of evolution. But if we rely on it too much, it stymies our progress. Um, the Terminator gives us technology where we unleash it and then it turns on us. The Matrix has the same thing. And we see this idea of technology as an oppressor of humanity without human intervention anymore. We've been cut out of the loop. It's all good, fun stuff. Now we have the film we're going to watch today. Sleep Dealer. When you watch this film, what I want you to do is look at it and look for the questions that this film is asking. Sleep Dealer is a modern piece of science fiction made on a very small budget but reflecting the issues that the director saw in the world today. He very deliberately set out to raise these questions. He wants people to think when they see his film. Questions like the concept of the global village and how much we charge to become part of that club. The idea of the difference between the rich and the poor and what people are willing to do, what sacrifices they're willing to make to try and jump the gap from one of those classes to the other. So when you watch the film, think about questions. Yes, it's a fun film. Enjoy the film. But realise that science fiction has something a little bit more to give than most of the Hollywood genres. Okay? Enjoy the film. Mi hogar, la casa donde crecí, me 
del Santana del Río, Oaxaca, México. Me llamo Mauricio. Just go first. I need to take them back to class. Well, um, hello everybody. I guess more, maybe half of you are my students in the class. Um, I'm Scarlett Riley. I teach engineering for those of you who uh, don't know me. And I actually brought my intro to engineering class to this uh, screening. And I'm glad that we had a chance to do this. Um, it's interesting to me because um, I often sing the praises of engineering and technology in my classrooms 
and I encourage my students to pursue their engineering careers and education and do something good for humanity. And I oftentimes, um, I guess, take engineering and I just say a couple of words about it. And I say engineering is about helping humanity. And then you see something like this and it kind of makes you think. But this is, I think, my conclusion, to put it very succinctly. Um, I know this movie used technology to send a very um, piercing message about politics and uh, our society, the way we look at other people. Uh, but if you just step away from that and look at the technology itself, you realize that it's not the technology, of course, it's the usage of technology and it's the application of technology that's in question. Uh, people, of course, advance technology and then they choose to use it for good or for bad. Of course, I'd like to believe that us, uh, as a society, we have done much more good with our technological advancements than we have done bad. But then again, that's just people who make those decisions. It comes down to one word and it's responsibility. Uh, with everything good, I know it sounds like a cliche, with comes something bad, it's you know the yin and the yang, the good and the bad. But um, as, I guess, people who have so much access to technology and technology will keep on improving and moving ahead. And in many, many respects, we're so grateful for that. Look at all the technological advancements in our uh, drug industry in terms of medicine and in terms of uh, surgical equipment, treating cancer, uh, other diseases, in terms of food production. Everything that we touch has something to do with technology. But with the same token, when you look at the other side, you see that, again, it could be uh, looked upon as an oppressor, but again, it's the people, not the technology itself. And I think that's uh, how I would like to wrap this up. And I will let our other professor look at the social and perhaps political message of the movie, but I'll just uh, talk about the technological aspect, that technology is good. It's the people, right? People are bad. It's the people are bad. Uh, hello, I'm Andrea Ergot, and I teach geography. And um, I actually don't like science fiction films. <laughs> so, so in that respect, I'm probably not a very good moderator. But as I was watching that, what struck me more than anything else was that if you could remove all of the technology take away the nodes and the computers and all that stuff. And it really was a rather disturbing reflection on some of the more negative aspects of globalization. You know, it, for me anyway, you know, I, I wasn't so interested in the technology. I was just more interested in the, the, the message that with globalization, with this idea that the world is becoming increasingly interconnected, that there are winners and there are losers. <coughs> considered to be people living in the more developed world, we're oblivious. You know, we, we have a very comfortable standard of living, but there's a reason why we do have a comfortable standard of living. And it's very often because other people or other um, environments are being exploited. So um, I, I came away from this feeling very depressed and very disturbed by it. I would like to think, I would like to have your view that technology is good, but Oh, it's a, it's a tough battle. <laughs> yes. I agree with you on that. As far as the whole social uh, structure of the movie went, it left me not with a good feeling. Even with the ending, it felt a bit yeah. movie-wise flawed, but over, but it's just there's a lot of impacts social-wise to have to for someone to feel guilty and then to essentially it's, it's a bit comforting. Yes. It's not a good feeling. Yes. Yes. Along with what you were saying, it kind of remind me of a time in our not so far past of when people did take the leadership of dictators, take the leadership of just not 
of taking mindless direction and actually using it. And yes, the technology may not necessarily be used for bad, but it can be. I mean, even Facebook, I think how they were connected with the memories, I mean, Facebook is kind of a semi-form of that. Mm -hmm. What are we putting on there? What memories? What yes. pictures are we putting on there? How are we using it? else can really sit there and look at it and do yeah. against us later on down the line. Um, and then also, I kind of, it was just, it reminded me kind of almost, you know, taking orders without, you know, any reason to kind of remind you of Hitler a little bit. Um, and then we do have drones today. When somebody is not in a personal fight, yes. the humanity aspect is taken out. And while that's great for technology-wise to keep one side out, however, should you really have two people there, that way there is what, did, did, it, uh, did it raise a lot of questions for you about the drone attacks and the issues that are actually going on today? You know, the, this idea that they were saying the nodes distance us. Yes. And that's exactly what the drone attacks do. They distance us from the face-to-face -face consequences of some of our actions. So, uh, yeah. I was just wondering whether other people were reflecting on things like that, on the drone attacks. The only thing I can really reflect upon is, as technology advances, what, what, certain, what is our ability for the safety of the users? Because with the nodes and the circuit, right now we have, we have cars that have circuit breakers to not have that happen yet. In the movie, they seem like nobody thought of a circuit breaker for the actual nodes themselves. Mm. That's my question as far as technology advancing. What things are we forgetting as far as safety goes? Yeah. Can I interrupt? Yeah, please. <laughs> this uh, discussion kind of makes me think of it this way. Going back to the uh, late 1800s, that's when cars came into play. Before that, people got around using horses. And I actually was reading an article uh, about this. Don't ask me why. But <laughs> Uh, apparently, New York City was just f filthy, disgusting place because of horse manure. And oh, yeah. each horse, yes, yes, seen each this. horse yeah. apparently could produce 15 to 30 pounds of horse manure a day. Mm. And then uh, in addition to that, they had flies everywhere because of that. There were people who were shoveling horse manure from the streets. That was their job. Um, horses were treated very poorly. They were beaten, not fed, because it was too expensive to take care of them. Owners would, you know, beat them and not feed them and give them water, and they would just work them to death. And then they would just haul them away, get another horse. Now we have a different view of horse. We think of it as a romantic animal, maybe, and uh, something, you know, nice. And but back then, it they were not treated that way, until cars came along. So when cars came along, they took away the problem of the horses and the filth and that inhumane treatment of horses, but then they brought about other problems that mm -hmm. now we're looking at that, right? We're looking at global warming in terms of CO2 em emissions. We're looking mm -hmm. at using our natural resources, running out of fossil fuels, our dependence on foreign oil. So here we have a technology that replaced something that was not good, Mm -hmm. And it, in a way, helped us, but then it created other problems. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, uh, just think about this, that every time a technological advancement occurs, it does something good, but it also creates a problem. And then it opens up opportunities to solve those problems using other technology. So it's like you solve one problem, you create another one, you solve that, you create another, and that just <coughs> kind of makes, you know, the, yeah. the world go around. And it creates jobs. I know this might sound a little callous, but if you think about this, somebody made the robots. Somebody wrote the program to program the robots. So then the job market is changing, right? Uh, the skills are changing. So we have to kind of evolve with that. I mean, I know that 
this, uh, this movie was about the workers and controlling and but kind of take all of that away and again I'm just trying to focus on the technology aspect of this the message is that the world is changing and we need different skills we need different set of uh, I guess graduates to be able to fill those jobs so again uh, technology engineering that's kind of where the world is going. The ethics thinking about. Absolutely, of course. I mean, just you know, with everything. When um, also power brings about a huge response because you can abuse your power. So if you have so much technology and you can control it, you can also abuse it. And again, uh, the bottom, uh, the root of all of this is humans. Um, and our responsibility, our morals, and our ethics of how we choose to, uh, you know, use technology. That's kind of my take on this. There, there's one other thing I wanted to bring up, um, is, is the idea of maquila doras. Because you were talking about how technology has evolved, but so do um, foreign policy agreements evolve, and so do international laws about trade evolve, and uh, things like this. In actual fact, what has happened is that the United States, Canada, and Mexico belong to a free trade agreement known as NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement. What that means, for instance, is that the United States and Canada can open up factories in, in Mexico and have goods made there using cheaper labor and cheaper land, so to keep down costs. And you can argue that this is a win-win situation because it means that American goods can be made more cheaply, certainly. It also means that Mexico gets jobs, which is something they desperately need. And it means that workers in Mexico, instead of having to cross the border into the United States to find employment, can stop at the border and f find employment in one of these maquiladoras. So some advocates would say that, that, that NAFTA has been very helpful in this respect, that these maquiladoras have been of great benefit to both the United States and Mexico. But you can also see it from a different point of view, and that would be that the companies are simply taking advantage of more lax environmental regulations, taking advantage of lax labor laws, and um, keeping down the costs of production by exploitation. So that would be the, <laughs> the critic's view of Maquila Doris. And as I was watching the film, I kept thinking, this is not that different from the Maquila Doris. Yes? Um, I was going to go back to the technology thing. If we end up going to technology and we can fix problems in technology and fixing problems that we see due to the human element, um, aren't we therefore creating just almost a bigger brother? You know, this was a big brother to where somebody was, you know, sitting there spying on her, you know, and getting information from her memories and this and that. So in a sense, it is big brother because he was a government official. But in order to take out that element, aren't you going to have to create another system on top of it to police that and then just create a bigger bureaucracy, a bigger... Isn't that, that our social, isn't that our order right now? We, we have that. <laughs> Even without technology, that's, if you really think about this, that's how our government system is anyway. Isn't it? We have to, yes. And, and the bigger the government gets, the bigger the big brother gets. So, um, so we, we can take that argument even, pardon me? But ethically, do we want that? Do we want to have the human or do we want to continue completely eradicate the human element and have it purely technology? We can never er eradicate the human element, and no one's suggesting that. We definitely cannot. If you eradicate the human element, then who's going to make the technology? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you can never do that. But, uh, but the technology built to make, to prevent errors that are due to the human element, you are then taking out you know, that sector of there are certain things that technology can replace you or can replace humans, but you can never take away humans uh, out of the equation completely. 
because I'll give you a simple example of what I'm trying to say. Um, I had an engineer who visited my classroom last night. And um, any of you in my CAT class last night? So you heard him. He was talking about uh, one of his most challenging uh, jobs. And he said it was to uh, design a machine that would um, shell coconuts. Okay? And I'll tell you where this is going very quickly. There are two kinds of coconuts, apparently. I didn't know this. I learned round ones and flat ones. So from Hawaii, you get round ones. But in Southeast Asia, apparently, there are kind of flat ones. And uh, they designed this machine for round coconuts because they got the order from Southeast Asia. They didn't know. So when the machine gets there, well, gee, this is wrong because they're flat coconuts. Now, why did they need the coconut machine? People with their machetes, uh, that was their job. They would you know, cut the coconut in half and shell it. And the more coconuts they shelled, the more money they would make. It was by piece. So the owners of plantations soon realized, and this is just a few years ago. I'm not talking like 100. This is like you know, about 10, 15 years ago. They realized that workers would not shell certain size coconuts. They're large ones, small ones, medium ones. The large ones were hard to cut. The small ones would slip out of their hands. So they kind of just pick the medium ones. So the plantation owner now is losing money because the large ones stay, the small ones stay, and humans are choosing to do the medium-sized ones. So they wanted a machine that could do the small ones and the large ones. So the humans, again, I know it's company and it's profit, but then again, they're the ones who are creating the jobs, correct? I mean, if they weren't there, then the jobs won't be there. Pardon me? <laughs> but then, but they weren't, you know, shelling the small ones or the large ones, so they needed technology to do that. So my point is, again, there are humans and technology side by side. Humans have a job, they do certain things, and then the technology does the other thing. So then, you know, they have a job, the owner makes money, and if owner makes money, you can hire more people and pay for them, and they have a job, and, you know, kind of makes the world go around that way. So they human element, pardon me? They should just pay them more. Well, I guess at some point, the companies have to make money. So they, you know, they have to stay profitable, so then they can, you know, hire more people. So, pardon me? Not so excessively. Well, uh, we we don't know where the where the where the cutoff uh, where the cutoff is for profitability. But just a simple example that I like to use, I guess, in this case, is that the human element can never go out of the equations. We need humans to repair machines. We need humans to in innovate, to think, to apply science, to you know make the machines. But you know, what, hap what is happening is the skill sets are changing. So we have, uh, you know, jobs that were not available 10 years ago. And right now, as a matter of fact, I know I'm teaching engineering, but what they're going to end up doing has not even been invented yet, probably. But five, six years from now, when they get their bachelor's degree, some of the stuff I'm teaching them may be, you know, obsolete. They have to learn some new skills. So we're constantly evolving. Yes. I uh, agree with you on that. Coming, uh, since I'm a theory major and I'm working with tech, I've realized that, uh, well, my current degree is saying it's true because with theater, the majority of stuff that's built and set up is all done by hand, a lot of hands. We rarely use uh, much machinery, but it's mostly by people building, cutting, measuring. And even with the actual uh, like the of theater in general, that's where, well, that's pretty much just kind of that section that you really can't cut out in humanity. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. Can I add is one this? more question for Andrea? Yes. Um, yeah. How probable is this future? Uh, I just read an article this morning that in uh, recent years, there is a higher percentage of Americans immigrating to Mexico than Mexicans mm -hmm. immigrating to United States. What does that fact tell us about? And yeah, why? 
Why are they immigrating? What is the reason? Uh, oh, I just did statistics. It no. wasn't a uh, complete analysis that I read, just statistics. So maybe Andrea. I, I, I do know that, that immigration from, the, from Mexico into the United States has reduced quite considerably. I would, only, I would imagine that perhaps if there's counter-immigration, Americans moving to Mexico, it could be Mexican-Americans moving back because all immigrants have a certain loyalty to their roots and where they're from. Uh, it could also be retirement, you know, cost of living um, issues. Um, but you, the, the first part, so you, you asked about how, whether this really, you know, about the future. Um, Richard, at the, during the introduction, said something that uh, science fiction films are about expand what, what was his definition expanding the science and I was thinking well this movie actually didn't expand very much I mean like like I like I said earlier you know if you remove the technology I don't think this was an expansion into the future at all I was I was thinking this is kind of an accurate reflection of uh, this is the cynic in me speaking but I, I thought it was a fairly accurate reflection of what's going on in terms of the, you know, the world dynamics, the global economy. God, I didn't know I was so radical. <laughs> yeah. There's another part of the story for me that's very interesting, and that is in computer science right now. There are theoreticians who are working with the idea of narratives in programming for, in, for computer intelligence. Oh, so, yeah. one of the things that happens yeah. in this movie is a narrative that has influence on creating the technology. Yeah. It's a very interesting idea. Yeah. Also, I mean, the question of ethics and the question of morality, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. We yeah. yeah, anyway. right. raised a lot of... Yes? I just want to make the comment. Uh, technology is grand, but oftentimes technology is in the service of the highest bidder. And the highest bidder yes. in our society is oftentimes the most immoral. Yeah. So that's I a good think point. that is something that's like, yeah, technology is good, but who gets to put it in motion and what do they put that in motion for? And for what purposes? So I'm you know, I'm just No, I'm that's actually that was my original uh, thesis. I said it's responsibility. Yeah. It's not the technology. It's the usage and the application of technology. Somebody brought up Facebook. I do not have a Facebook account. I despise that. Uh, I really do. Uh, number one, I don't have time for it. I don't, can't even check my own emails. Number two, like you sit, it's like you know, you're spying on your friend's friend, pictures, this, that. It just boggles my mind. But in, uh, again, you know, responsibility, I completely agree with well, that. Unfortunately, yes, yeah, yeah, social... With it is the, the people who are best able to afford yeah. to direct the technology, they stay in, in place. This is not, we're talking about you and me and everybody here right. having a say in it. Mm -hmm. The people that direct technology, they're well entrenched and they remain well, there. Like they continue to remain there. And shift the future for their own advantage, which is not necessarily our advantage. So I, that's the problem I have with technology, is that yeah, the, it's the social inherently in the wrong hand. The social responsibility is not always compatible with the profit motive of the company. I mean, I guess when it trickles down, we, we do get benefits from it. But um, what another simple thing that always, um, you know, I think about just phone, cell phone chargers, if you change your cell phone, the old charger does not fit, and you have to get a new charger. Like, I'm thinking, why? Why can't we use the same charger? They almost on purpose do that. So then you have to go out and buy something else, right? And in engineering, we do talk about this, that you have to have some environmental responsibility, social responsibility. Every time I throw something away, I'm creating more waste, more pollution, wasting resources. So, you know, when you can take that argument and make it really big or make it really small, applicable, but it all comes down to responsibility, morals, and ethics. Which companies like Monsanto don't have. <laughs> um, are there any topics that anybody feels that have not been raised that we should be talking about, or have you had enough? 
Yeah. You probably already talked about this, but when you guys were talking about Facebook, it just seemed like technology not only has a bad side, but like, it always has a bad and a good side. Yeah, that's For example, exactly. like Facebook, you're basically spying on other people. But another one of the positive sides of Facebook is it also connects you to the loved ones who might be in other countries. For example, my entire family, they live nine, ten thousand 10,000 miles away in another country. And Facebook basically closes the distance between us. Mm -hmm. We will talk, see what each other is doing, pictures, and all that kind of stuff. So. And, and just, it's important, you can, you can cut off everybody except your family exactly. on Facebook. You're not spying on someone unless you let them spy on your way. So that's it. Okay. And we give up our rights. <laughs> so technology not only, like, it could distance us, but it also could close the gap. Well, it did. I guess with the advent of airplanes that you could fly instead of take the ship or with the telegraph, then came the telephone, right? I mean, all these technological advancements, of course, did that. I, okay, I, there is something positive about Facebook. I like one person. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes. Okay. I thought it was interesting to use a propaganda tool. Like, you know, you're going to have I notice how they went after the terrorists without doing, well, I know it's a movie and it is probably, but they didn't go after it and find out exactly if it is a terrorist, not a terrorist, what are they doing? It was they like a, a yeah, exactly. So one more question, right? Uh, I had one last topic. Yeah, one last topic. Uh, like the rise of Islam, Islamic terrorism, and then the trials and technologies been quite steep lately, right? And I, I just have a feeling that it's going to start slowing down dramatically, and it's probably prone to failure. So we're always going to be reliable on our human capability. We're always going to fall back to that. And one day, who knows, maybe technology won't be. I mean, like, I mean, like electronics won't be there for us. If we're going to need our, each other. Months. I think one bad accident where all these things are being controlled can wipe out everything and we're going to be back to not, not even being able to use our phones. Which is fine so, that's how we start. That's how we start. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we continue this discussion on the uh, EROF website and you will find URL at the bottom of each one of the posters that you're seeing around. So it will be an ongoing discussion about each one of the topics that we're Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much.